So it's looking at it beyond just eat more produce, but let's also eat nose to tail. And let's also take nutrition a little bit beyond this very binary, like this nutrient's good, this nutrient's bad, calories in, calories out, this sort of like number obsession that I think nutrition has become and go back a little bit more to our roots of sort of looking at the wisdom that the whole food would have on its own. Living a healthy, balanced life is no small feat, especially when you're a mom. With meals to cook, laundry to load, work to do, and humans to raise, it can be easy to feel like we're in an on-again, off-again relationship with healthy living. But it doesn't have to feel this way. I believe living a healthy life has become way too complicated. What we need isn't a new plan or program telling us what to eat or how to live. We need simple, uncomplicated routines and information that's going to help us live our best, most beautiful life without rules and restrictions. Join me, Kristen Dofniak, holistic health coach, certified intuitive eating counselor, and mama of two for weekly conversations on what it means to live a healthy, balanced life, uncomplicate eating, and simplify in every area of mom life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. Kristen here, and today I have another incredible guest for you. So I did a call out for questions for season three of the podcast and topics for things that women wanted to learn more about. And one of the top requests for more information was prenatal nutrition. And I knew just the person I wanted to share with you to talk all about prenatal nutrition, specifically real food for pregnancy. So I am so, so excited that she agreed to come on and share with you today. So I'm going to give you her incredible bio in just a second. But Lily Nichols is a registered dietitian nutritionist. She's the author of Real Food for Pregnancy and Real Food for Gestational Diabetes, which was her first book. And hearing her on a podcast and getting her book was one of the things that helped me to manage my health in my second pregnancy. So for those of you who don't know, I had gestational diabetes with my first pregnancy and a whole host of complications. It was a really scary time really trying to navigate my health, going into pregnancy, thinking that I was young and healthy. I was only 24, and I thought that I was just going to have this picture-perfect pregnancy, as most of us, I think, go into pregnancy thinking or hoping that we will have an easy, healthy pregnancy. And for all intents and purposes, my pregnancy was pretty normal, but I ended up with a lot of complications towards the end. And Later on, after my pregnancy, kind of coming to terms with wanting to have another baby, I started doing some research on really maybe some of the things that I hadn't been focusing on in my first pregnancy that was so full of anxiety and do lists and don't lists and knowing a lot about eating a a diet rich in real whole foods but maybe going too far along the side of obsessing over getting in the right things and not looking at the overall picture and really not tuning in to my body. So one of the reasons I love Lily is that she is a researcher. She is not afraid to debunk the myths and the gaps that are in our conventional advice when it comes to pregnancy, when it comes to not just pregnancy, but also gestational diabetes and really get into the research and really share with women what is really ultimately important when it comes to what they need for a healthy pregnancy for them and for baby's development. But she does it in a really practical, doable way, as you'll hear in the interview. She doesn't recommend things like tracking and measuring and counting and obsessing over your food, but simple strategies for balancing your blood sugar, getting in more nutrients. She talks about some of the nutrients that are not emphasized enough. We talk about fear foods during pregnancy and how, you know, we don't need to fear foods in the way that a lot of us have during pregnancy. We did dig into gestational diabetes. We talked about mindful eating during pregnancy, 
we talked about specifics for how women can go about, you know, making simple changes for having a healthier pregnancy, specific nutrient needs. We could have talked for three hours. It This interview was so packed with practical, tangible information for you. And we had a lot of fun talking about it as well. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So for those of you who don't yet know her, Lily Nichols is a registered dietitian nutritionist, certified diabetes educator, researcher, and and author with a passion for evidence-based prenatal nutrition. Drawing from the current scientific literature and wisdom of traditional cultures, her work is known for being research-focused, thorough, and sensible. Her best-selling book, Real Food for Gestational Diabetes, and online course of the same name, presents a revolutionary, nutrient-dense, lower-carb approach for managing gestational diabetes. Her work has not only helped tens of thousands of women manage their gestational diabetes, most without the need for blood sugar-lowering medication, but has also influenced nutrition policies internationally. Lily's clinical experience and extensive background in prenatal nutrition have made her a highly sought-after consultant and speaker in the field. Lily's second book, Real Food for Pregnancy, is an evidence-based look at the gap between conventional prenatal nutrition guidelines and what's optimal for mother and baby. With over 930 citations, this is the most comprehensive text on prenatal nutrition to date. Lily is also the creator of the popular blog LilyNicholsRDN.com, which explores a variety of topics related to real food, mindful eating, and pregnancy nutrition. Friends, you are going to love this interview, whether you are in the phase of thinking about having a baby or you're pregnant now or you're thinking about having a second baby, this is going to be jam-packed with information. I know you're going to love it. So without further ado, here is my interview with Lily. Hi, Lily. Welcome to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. I am so excited to have you on. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So I love starting with just a fun little icebreaker. I know we've been chatting for a couple minutes, but I love to ask my guests, what is the first thing you drink when you wake up in the morning? Oh, well, absolutely first thing, probably some water. But then after that, I'm, I'm a tea person, not a coffee person. No offense to anyone who's a coffee person, but next thing would be um, a cup of black tea. Nice. So I am sure that my many of my listeners, just by the nature of most of my listeners being moms, are familiar with your work, but I would love if you could just share a little bit more how you got into the field of nutrition, specifically prenatal nutrition, and really what you are passionate about bringing to the world. Sure. So I actually got into nutrition at a pretty young age. So by the time I was in high school, I knew I wanted to study nutrition and I didn't change my mind. How I ended up going into the prenatal side of things was actually a little bit by accident. So I had finished my schooling, finished my internship, had been a registered dietitian for a bit, and had the opportunity to work with the California Diabetes and Pregnancy Program, which is also called Sweet Success. And so it's kind of funny because I, I got into the prenatal field in a very specific area and also in sort of a public policy capacity versus I mean, other than what I had seen clinically, my limited early clinical experience. Um, So I went at it a little bit backwards and starting in public policy and then moving into clinical practice and moving into private practice. But what really lit me up about prenatal nutrition was with gestational diabetes, there's a huge amount that we can do to improve outcomes for mama and baby. And it's really just a matter of better blood sugar numbers. doesn't matter if you have the label or not. If you have pretty well controlled blood sugar, there's very few risks uh, to you and the baby. But on the flip side, if blood sugar is not well controlled, um, it can have some, some not so great outcomes. And one of the ones that I found most compelling was that it can impact that child for the rest of their life, actually. There's a six-fold higher risk of that child developing type 2 diabetes or obesity by the time they're a teenager um, in the case where blood sugar is not well controlled. I always like to emphasize that because people get really doom and gloom about that diagnosis, but there's a lot that's within your control. So from there, uh, working in clinical practice, I saw, you know, oh my word, using the guidelines that I had worked on. Uh, didn't actually improve outcomes in many cases. A lot of my clients' blood sugars were getting worse. And so that's what led me to uh, look for an alternative and come up with um, basically what I outline in Real Food for Gestational Diabetes, my first book. 
Um, and from there, working in also just general prenatal nutrition, looking at how the guidelines are set and why they're set, which is something that, you know, a lot of dietitians just aren't, we just aren't looking at, we're not asking questions as deep as like, are the RDAs actually correct? Are the, you know, macronutrient ratios actually correct? Could we do different? What could be better? What do traditional cultures eat? What is their micronutrient intake look like compared to when you follow the guidelines? And so all of those rabbit holes and my own pregnancy, first pregnancy led me to write um, Real Food for Pregnancy, my second book. Um, which is really just trying to look at the gap between what the guidelines say and what the current evidence says and see how we can just serve mamas and babies better, just improve outcomes, make pregnancy less annoying <laughs> because it can be kind of annoying, improve postpartum recovery, improve baby's health. Mm, yeah. I love that so much. I think, you know, when I was pregnant with my first, which at this point was almost eight years ago, she's six and a half. So she'll be seven in November. And I know there was so much information out there and I was already in kind of the holistic nutrition world. So, but I was receiving information from both sides when it came from, you know, these, these are the books and the packets that they give you at, I, I saw a midwife, but it was, um, a public midwife. They work in the public healthcare system in Canada. Um, so we get kind of all the same information. And then over here in the holistic world and really trying to work through it and kind of make those choices for myself and my baby was was hard and a little bit overwhelming. So I'm also a big proponent of real food and really making simple shifts to eating more real food and how profound that can have an effect on our health really overall at any point in our life, but especially, you know, during um, this prenatal period. So I'm wondering how you define real food and sort of why, why is real food important for pregnancy? Sure. So my definition of real food is looking at foods that are as least processed as possible. So you find them as they are in nature and you're not intentionally trying to separate out parts of the food because, you know, fat is bad or, or some other, some other focus, they call it nutritionism, where you like single out a nutrient as like, this one's good, this one's bad. So we have to separate part from the whole and throw away the bad part. Right. So, you know, while I think a lot of people would, would agree that real food is just unprocessed food in its natural form straight from the earth. I take it a step further because I feel like most people are just looking at you know, oh, you eat more produce and just kind of leave it at that. But I'm also looking at our animal foods and how do our animal foods actually come, you know, as nature intends. An egg has a yolk in it, right? You got to eat the whole egg to get the full complement of nutrients. If you consume dairy products, dairy products come with fat. It's only humans who think that we can make it better by taking out the fat or reducing the content of fat. But again, you're losing some of the nutrients that are in the food and some of the synergy of, as the nutrients work together. Same thing with, you know, boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Like because we're so separated from how our food is grown, we're not eating in its whole form. And if you were to go back even just 100 or 200 years ago, you would have had the full animal you would have eaten the skin on the chicken. You would have saved the bones and all the parts of it to make broth afterwards. So technically you'd be eating those parts. You'd be eating the organ meats. So it's looking at it beyond just eat more produce, but let's also eat nose to tail. And let's also take nutrition a little bit beyond this very binary, like this nutrient's good, this nutrient's bad calories in calories out this sort of like number obsession that i think nutrition has become and go back a little bit more to our roots of sort of looking at the wisdom that the whole food would have on its own so i'm looking at it beyond just the plant food eat more vegetables perspective 
Mm, yes. Yeah. I am nodding along with you. You can see me nodding along with you over here. Cause these are some of those things that, so I went to school initially for dietetics before I started studying holistic nutrition. And there was so much difference in some of what I was learning about just reading, you know, like the book, nourishing traditions. I'm like, what do you mean right. we can eat the bones? We can make a bone broth. What do you mean? Like the fat on chicken or the skin helps us to absorb the nutrients. It's so fascinating. So can you go into a little bit more about why eating more real food, more traditional foods is important specifically for women who are pregnant? Yes. And just a quick nod to Nourishing Traditions, that book heavily influenced me as well. I read that before mm. I went through my dietetics education. So um, I was very uh, skeptical of everything I was learning because I had already understood nutrition through a different lens and it already experimented with, I was vegetarian at the time and it already experimented with adding in animal foods and specifically more animal fats and how much better I felt. And it was like, yeah. whoa, like wh why is there such a disconnect be behind like what she's saying and what my body is saying and what this textbook says yeah. also versus what the science actually says, right? Because you read the yeah. medical journals and you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't line up with the guidelines. What? So uh, back, back to your question, though, uh, as to why, you know, whole foods and a more ancestral approach to nutrition matters is when you actually look at the micronutrients, like the vitamins and minerals most required in pregnancy and most required for a baby's development, and then look at where we find those nutrients in food. And then as I like to do, I sort of reverse engineered what an optimal prenatal diet would look like using those foods. You'll see that you actually consume significantly greater amount of micronutrients if you focus your diet on whole unprocessed foods versus by the conventional standard, just by default, because they work from uh, this is the macronutrient breakdown, fat, carbs, and protein, and thus you need to eat this many servings from these different food groups, that's sort of the conventional dietetics approach, uh, you're eating 45 to 65% of your calories from carbohydrates. And carbohydrate foods just are not the ones that are most concentrated in some of these hard to get nutrients like vitamin B12 or iron or zinc, or you, know, you can list on and on a number of nutrients that are just either not found or not very concentrated in our carbohydrate foods. Therefore, you end up with a more nutrient deficient diet and their sort of workaround is that they emphasize fortified foods. So, you know, our white flour is fortified with folic acid and it's fortified with iron. Doesn't matter that those forms of those nutrients aren't the same as what's found in real food and aren't as well utilized by the body, but you know, they're fortified, so it's fine. Just eat half your grains whole. The rest can be refined white flour that's been fortified with some of these nutrients. And I'm more like, wait a minute. Okay, if we need more of these nutrients, why don't we go direct to the food source instead of this sort of scientism? Let's just, you know, food science this white flour and make it nutritious. Like, no, it only gets you maybe a quarter of the way there nutrition-wise and even still falls flat on its face. Let's go for real food instead. And for as much as we know from nutrition science, there's really a lot that we don't know because the way that nutrition has been studied has been very deductive where we might see a benefit by, say, some of these old studies, you incorporate a certain food and why are these lab rats so much healthier? And they try to um, take it down to the level of isolating the single nutrient that's responsible for the benefit. So it was very much looking from like a stark nutrient deficiency perspective. Like these animals developed scurvy when they did not have, oh, we found out it's vitamin C, right? And that's all fine and good. It's good to have that level, but we need to actually take it beyond that where we start sort of fitting the puzzle pieces back together and looking at, oh, hey, it's not just the vitamin C, but probably the bioflavonoids that are also in the citrus fruit. And it's not just the, you know, iron that was in your, you know, liver supplement that corrected the anemia, which before we had supplementation available, that's how they corrected anemia, which was liver. 
Now we know from a lot of other studies that actually when you have the combination of iron and vitamin A and vitamin B12 together, it is much more effective at treating anemia. And oh, hey, those nutrients all just happen to be high in liver, which we found was <laughs> a, a very solid treatment for anemia way back in like the 1920s. So there's some of this stuff where we've sort of, we need to kind of circle back to the whole food, in my opinion, um, because there, there's a lot going on with the um, concentrations of nutrients and the nutrient synergy in those foods that just, it goes beyond what we can fit into a prenatal vitamin. You know, they're in different forms, different combinations. It just works better when you're getting at least the majority of your nutrients through whole food sources, just as humankind always did up until the last hundred years when we created supplementation. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so nodding along with you because I'm, I'm with you in that I think so much of nutrition science has just gone, maybe not the science has gone too far, but it's gone too far in what they're telling us, you know, like you're saying as in the public, you know, this is the one nutrient we need versus if you eat more real whole foods and if you are deficient in this, if you eat more of these types of foods, instead of just take the supplement, do this one thing and why is it not working? So I love that so much. And, you know, for me, learning a lot of this really gave me a lot more, I think, comfort in my early pregnancy, I think. And I mean, being a first time pregnant woman, I was anxious and being someone who's naturally a bit anxious too, I was anxious for a lot of reasons. And I think a lot of pregnant women are just making sure I was getting enough. But I think knowing that you can get a lot of what you need through food and it, it can be easier than they tell you. I think sometimes in conventional yes. nutrition when you are eating more real whole foods. So I love that so much. So one of the things that I really love about your work and something that you're not afraid to do is really debunk a lot of the myths and these gaps that there are around prenatal nutrition. So, and oh my gosh, something I read on your, on your website, and I loved this and it was mind blowing, is that it takes an average of 17 years for research to make it into practice, which is crazy. That is way too long. And that means that we are basically 17 years behind in the recommendations or the conventional recommendations. So I'm wondering what you would identify as maybe the biggest gaps in the world of conventional prenatal nutrition. There are a lot to choose from. So, you know, and by the way, that 17 years is from a study actually, and they they were talking about clinical practice. So that's not even guidelines. Mm. Guidelines take even longer to get updated. Yeah. So just, just keep that in mind. Oh <laughs> and then you gosh. hope the people who are on the guidelines committee are actually willing to look at some of that evidence. So that's a whole nother rabbit hole. As far as prenatal nutrition though, um, as I alluded to earlier, because they are really an extrapolation of the general public dietary guidelines. Until the general public dietary guidelines shift, I'm, I'm not sure we're gonna see big shifts in the prenatal guidelines as well, but I will point out some holes. So I mentioned the carbohydrate recommendations, you know, really about half of your diet, maybe a little less, maybe quite a bit more, they say should be coming from carbohydrates and those just by default most of your carbohydrate source foods are not very rich in the micronutrients you need in pregnancy so that is a problem the level of carbohydrates i think for many people not all is too high and particularly with a population you know the us population the current estimate is that 49 to 52% of americans have either type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, most of which are undiagnosed. And a lot of diabetes is sort of uncovered or first recognized in pregnancy. And we just lump it under this catch-all of gestational diabetes. But many people have pre-existing blood sugar issues that they just didn't know about because 
they don't test, uh, the thresholds in pregnancy are lower, the stress that your body goes through in pregnancy naturally makes insulin resistance go up, so blood sugar issues can get worse. But nonetheless, if we're assuming about half the population has diabetes of some kind, and about half of our population is women, those who are going to get pregnant also, there's probably going to be like at least half of the pregnant population that finds the carbohydrate levels in the guidelines just far too, too high to maintain normal blood sugar. So I think that is something that we need to have, you know, a, a broader range, a broader consideration of what you can do instead of just this blanket low carb is unsafe, which is what they always say. That's basically why Real Food for Gestational Diabetes was written, by the way, was to defend that you can indeed go lower carb and you can do it safely. And I show you how to do it safely while not running into any nutrient deficiencies. Um, another area is protein. So, it, you know, just focusing on the macronutrients, we could talk for like an hour. So a lot of the recommendations made for pregnancy are based on estimates. They're not always based on a direct study. It's really hard to study pregnancy and it's hard to do it ethically, meaning you can't really subject like a, a group of pregnant women to a nutrient deficient state and not have some sort of an ethical concern there, right? So a lot of the guidelines are estimates and that's all fine and good until we have new ways of performing research, like there's been some new ways to look at protein requirements recently. And the first ever study that directly estimated protein requirements in pregnancy was done in 2015. So that's only five years ago. And they found that the protein requirements in pregnancy are significantly um, an underestimate of the true needs. So for early pregnancy, which in this study they basically defined as like the first half of pregnancy, Protein requirements were underestimated by, I think it was 39%. And in later pregnancy, protein requirements were underestimated by, it was, it was over 70%. I can't remember the exact number, but it's in Real Food for Pregnancy if you want to look up the study. Um, but that's, that's huge. <laughs> that's significant because that means that for decades we've been telling people that you need to aim for this low number and that's enough. And sure enough, it's not. And we know that there's also individual differences in protein needs. So there's probably a group of people who are going to require above and beyond that recommendation. And, you know, maybe a handful of people that might um, need slightly less, but still that's a major underestimate. That's a major error. And they still have yet to update the guidelines on that point. So that's huge. Um, I'll point out one more because I could just keep going and going and going. And that is um, choline requirements. So, Choline is a um, B vitamin-like compound uh, that has some, shares some functions in the body or works right alongside, I should say, um, folate. So we think about folate for the prevention of neural tube defects. Choline is just as important, if not more important than, than folate um, for that function. It's also very important for baby's brain development, for placental health, for prevention of preeclampsia. We have all these interesting studies on choline now. But we did not even have a recommended intake for choline until 1998. It's a pretty like new kid on the block in the nutrition world. Moreover, the requirements for pregnancy were an estimate based on studies in men. Now they've done some studies after they've revealed how important choline is, especially for women in their reproductive years and in pregnancy and breastfeeding. They've done some studies where they, and they're really well-designed trials, randomized controlled trials, where they have supplemented the control group got actually a little bit more than the recommended intake, and the treatment group got like double that. Then they measured a number of different outcomes. There's a couple studies on it. The one I'll highlight is on infant reaction times, which would be a proxy for brain development. They found that in the group that received the double quantity of choline, reaction time was improved, meaning the babies had faster reaction time at all time points they were tested in infancy and toddlerhood. So this is significant because A, the choline requirements for pregnancy are probably an underestimate. They're probably wrong, but already 94% of pregnant women do not even meet the current low recommended intake. 
And what happens if we actually get people to meet that intake? Well, it just so happens that choline is most concentrated in animal foods, especially high cholesterol animal foods, egg yolks and liver being some of the main ones. So if we're still all so obsessed with keeping saturated fat and cholesterol intake as low as possible because somebody somewhere deemed them as evil nutrients at one point in time, we're guaranteeing choline deficiency and thus actually guaranteeing, maybe not guaranteeing, that might be a strong one, but we're pushing this pregnancy outcome, this child's life trajectory towards impaired brain development. I mean, really, the studies are, these are strong words, and so people listening will be like, what? you know, but I'm serious, like when I, every time I say something, I'm like in my head thinking of multiple site research citations that actually go along to back what I'm saying. The research on choline and brain development is unequivocal. And if you don't include, for example, eggs in your diet with the yolks, which is where the choline is, your chance of being deficient in choline is like doubled, right? So if we're, you know, basing our recommendations on this top down, you can't have fat, you can't have saturated fat, but then it's creating nutrient deficiencies on the back end, we're in trouble. And it's not just choline, you can list off, you know, a whole laundry list of nutrients that happen to be deficient if you start getting super nitpicky on the saturated fat and cholesterol. So suffice to say, a lot of our nutrition requirements for pregnancy, nutrition recommendations, I should, should say, for pregnancy really need to be flipped on their head if we want to try to really make a dent in preventing micronutrient deficiencies and then all the carryover negative effects that that can have on pregnancy outcomes, postpartum recovery, baby's development, nutrient transfer into breast milk, and on and on and on and on. Oh my gosh. I'm over here. I was muted for a second because they were doing yard work next door to me. And I'm like, no, they need to hear this information. (laughs) I'm nodding along with you and going, oh my gosh, there's so much of that that I didn't even realize. And I know a lot of the, I know the importance of choline, but I don't think I knew how important it was. And I know it was one of those things where I was like, oh yeah, during my pregnancy, I'm going to make sure I eat a lot of eggs. And it's really funny because my first pregnancy, I was, I was not into eggs at all. And I kind of had to almost force myself to eat them because I knew that they were, they were one important source of nutrients. My second pregnancy, I craved them the whole time, oh, which was interesting. And I just, I ate a ton of them. So I'm curious sort of with all of this, you know, I know you said you could go on, I'm sure you could go on for hours and they'll just have to go pick up your book to read more of the research when it comes to kind of those big gaps. But I'm wondering the woman listening who is a little overwhelmed, she's like, okay, I don't have to eat so many carbs. I need to eat more protein. Oh my gosh, choline. (laughs) Do you have some, maybe some practical advice for, you know, other than simply, you know, like you said, eating more real food, but also looking more to the kind of the traditional food side of things. Do you have any practical recommendations for the woman who might be on her way to becoming pregnant, you know, in that, you know, trying to conceive phase or in her maybe early pregnancy who wants to try and get some more of these um, nutrients or some more of the nutrients that you think are most important in? Where do you think she should start? Sure. Yeah. I can get into the weeds, but we can also make things really simple. Um, I will point out for people who are like really early pregnancy, a lot of people are going to be experiencing food aversions and nausea. And so that's a, that really is a very tricky time to be like, I'm going to really up my nutrition and eat all these eggs and green leafy vegetables. So, you know, really give yourself a ton of grace in the first trimester. Um, Don't, don't freak out if you're listening to this and you're, you're early on and not able to eat all the foods I'm going to be talking about. If you go all the way back to preconception, that's like, of course, the most optimal time to begin incorporating some of the real food because you can build up your nutrient stores uh, ahead of time before any of the nausea and food aversions hit. But don't freak out if you if you didn't do that ahead of time. Uh, so some of the things that I find the most helpful is is pointing out which foods are most nutrient dense, meaning you have a lot of these micronutrients that I'm talking about, and just making you know baby steps at incorporating more of those foods into your world i also like to focus on blood sugar balance just as a whole it doesn't matter if you have blood sugar issues or not anything diagnosed or not it's important for 
all of us. It's important for our hormone balance, among many other things. Um, but also our hunger, fullness cues, cravings, all that has at least some tie back to our blood sugar balance. So if we look at those two things, I like to focus on people, A, not being afraid of fat um, from, you know, unprocessed real food sources, and B, trying to prioritize protein. Now, protein in nature usually automatically comes packaged with fat. So if you focus on getting more protein in your diet and you're not obsessively taking the fat out of that protein, meaning you're not cutting the fat off your steak, you're not taking the skin off your chicken, you're not taking the yolks out of your eggs, a lot of things kind of take care of themselves because our protein foods are by default, if they're unprocessed real food sources, really rich in micronutrients as well. The other nice thing about our protein foods is they stabilize our blood sugar quite a bit. So it's very satiating, it's filling. So that means that your carryover effect later in the day is you won't have a blood sugar spike and crash usually after eating a meal that has a significant amount of protein or just enough, I should just say enough protein for you. You'll be full for a couple hours, your blood sugar won't tank, and by the time you're ready to eat again, you it'll be less likely that you have intense cravings for some type of processed junk food that isn't filling up your nutrient stores, right? Because it all ties back into your blood sugar balance. So it's a bit of a two birds with one stone situation. And I know there are some people who are, you know, into intermittent fasting and that's fine. But I find that many people, if you fix breakfast or whenever the first meal of their day is, that sets the stage for your blood sugar balance, your cravings and whatever for the rest of the day. So that means if you prioritize getting enough protein at your first meal of the day, which for most people is breakfast, watch the carryover effects later on. So examples of this in real food terms, instead of having oatmeal and fruit and brown sugar for breakfast, which is all carbs, which is going to give you a blood sugar roller coaster and make you be pretty hungry pretty soon. And you'll probably be craving like sugar and caffeine mid morning as a pick me up. Try having eggs with vegetables or sausage with vegetables or eggs and sausage and vegetables or some kind of dinner that you had left over from the night before that included a you know a hearty source of protein or um, greek yogurt or cottage cheese which are high protein um, types of dairy with some nuts and maybe a little bit of fruit for the flavor maybe some berries which are especially low sugar and just observe how you feel within the hour two or three after that meal and observe what kinds of foods you're craving at lunchtime and dinner time. Just make note. Um, but by having something that has more protein, it'll be, it's almost always a significant difference. This is like the thing that I've been telling clients basically my entire career as a dietitian and you make this one change and people think you're some sort of a miracle worker. And I'll tell you as a person who's, you know, been, at least attempting to eat well for for as long as I've been interested in nutrition, I still will make exceptions some days and be like, oh, I'm going to have, I think I will have oatmeal. Oh, what's the harm in having a pastry for breakfast? Or, you know, fruit sounds good. I'll just have a piece of fruit for breakfast. And then man, the way you feel the rest of the day is totally thrown off. And that's fine. It's actually good to have some of these experiments thrown in here and there, but really, truly listen to your body and get back to what keeps me feeling well. And a lot of times you'll have your answer if you just listen. Yes. Oh my gosh. And I'm, you know, nodding along again with, you know, it's when we listen to our bodies and when we make just simple changes and notice what actually feels good it is way less complicated, I think, sometimes than we make it out to be. And I think we keep coming back to that, right? Like there's a lot of research that hasn't come into play where it might need to, but then when you really look at what it actually takes to meet these needs, a lot of it is less complicated if we only had the right things in place. So I love that simple recommendation for eating more protein, but specifically starting the day with more protein to set you up for 
better blood sugar. That's something I learned years ago, and it really has made a significant difference in my own life as well. And it's so different now being where I am in my own health journey. And I know, um, you know, probably many of the women listening, but if the woman listening is, has not heard this before, who doesn't understand anything about blood sugar, traditional American breakfast is like, you know, oatmeal and banana or cereal and milk, or just grab a piece of toast on the way out the door. But what a profound difference you could make if even if you just added some eggs to that toast or you just had some exactly. eggs instead. And so I love that so much. Simple, but really effective. So that's so great. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about the some of the recommendations that I think kind of bring up a lot of fear in women when it comes to pregnancy, because I know that um, I already shared that I was very anxious the beginning of my first pregnancy, just being a new mom, wanting to do everything right. And I think I was very focused on the don't eat list that I got so focused on the things that I shouldn't eat that, you know, then I was trying to add in the things I should and it drove me crazy. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, if there are maybe any differences or differing recommendations that you would have versus the research when it comes to like this long list of don'ts or do you have a list of, or is there any way? maybe we can simplify the do eat versus the don't eat list. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think your experience is um, very common. I saw this all the time in practice where one of the first questions that comes up is what can't I eat? So there's this fear that if you mess up, you're going to like mess up the whole pregnancy and it's going to be dangerous. So I think first of all, people need to understand where the, of foods to avoid or do not eat list come from and how strong or not strong the recommendations are for those foods. So most of the foods on the do not eat list, and by the way, this varies by country, which is fascinating, but at least in the, in the US and most of the West, it is for food safety reasons primarily. They want to avoid you getting food poisoning really. Um, with salmonella or listeria or some other type of bacteria that could make you sick. And so they, you know, put a whole list together of foods that might contain those problematic pathogenic bacteria and then tell you not to eat them. There's also the concerns about mercury would be like the second thing that I think comes into play. And so there are specifics on the type of fish um, that you would want to avoid perhaps. And by the way, those would be like swordfish, king mackerel, shark and tilefish are on the do not eat list by the FDA. And they also recommend limiting tuna to less than six ounces per week. That's all fine and good. I really don't have problems with those recommendations, although I do think they should be talking more about low mercury fish and how it's totally fine to have some because they do actually encourage 12 ounces of fish per week. Um, I think you can do even more than that, but 12 ounces is a minimum. I mean, that is, that is actually rare that I see a client who's getting 12 ounces of fish per week. And that's even by the very stringent FDA guidelines, they're still recommending 12 ounces, right? So you're yeah. like, it's okay for you to have fish. Um, you know, salmon, sardines, um, cod, um, shrimp, oysters, clams, like these are, these are good sources of nutrients. In fact, they're one of the types of foods that I really highly recommend, especially if you're going to attempt to meet your omega-3 and selenium and iodine needs from food alone. That's, you got to eat some seafood. Mm -hmm. Back to the food safety side of things, though, um, what I find kind of frustrating about those lists is that they, in my opinion, really overblow the actual risk of food poisoning from those particular foods. So with um, eggs with runny yolks, for example, you can't eat eggs with runny yolks, right? Well, undercooked eggs, going to get salmonella. But when you look at the chances that an egg might contain salmonella. It's anywhere from one in 12,000 to one in 30,000 eggs. Very rare. Sevenfold lower rate if those chickens were raised on, in an organic operation or on pasture because healthier hens are less likely to harbor pathogenic bacteria. Just like us humans, when we eat better food, our gut health and our microbiome is better, right? Um, 
Eggs as a whole in the U.S. account for only 2% of foodborne illness outbreaks nationwide. 46% of foodborne illness outbreaks are from produce, primarily fruit and leafy green vegetables. But fruit and leafy green vegetables do not show up on the do not eat list. So I just play devil's advocate because ultimately it comes down to we literally can never guarantee any food is safe or unsafe and in my opinion i think it's arbitrary what has made it on the do not eat list or the aok list when you go to other countries they have no problem with you eating fish even sushi in many places that includes the uk it's not just parts of asia um, but they'll have a, a warning about raw salads and raw fruit so you know some countries are i think in many ways, a little more ahead of the US. But I think instead of coming up with this lengthy list of this food is always unsafe, we should instead be educating on common, like just basic food safety practices, which a lot of people aren't doing. So the way you store and prepare your foods, the establishments that you purchase food from, proper reheating, proper hand washing and cleanliness in the kitchen, um, and yeah, there's, of course, there's going to be foods that are more likely to make you sick. I mean, you should be, of course, always careful when you're handling raw meat and cleaning up your kitchen after handling meat. I mean, to the degree that, you know, I find a lot of people aren't, you know, you open up a package of meat and you start seasoning it, touching all your seasoning containers with your dirty raw meat hands, you know, it's like, well, that should be something we're educating on instead of educating on if you eat a turkey sandwich because it's deli meat turkey, like you're going to get listeria. Like, no, the chances that the, the, the estimated rates of listeriosis from deli meat is I think one in 83,000 servings of deli meat. It's very, very slim. So I just play devil's advocate. And, and I think we just need to be, you know, uh, more common sense and more instructive about, um, the, the relative risks of getting sick. And then on the flip side, I think also discussing the possible risks of ending up with nutrient deficiency is if you take those lists all the way to the letter. Because I know quite a few people who take it to the degree that I'm not going to have any fish because it could have some mercury. Well, you've basically guaranteed some nutrient deficiencies unless you're really diligently supplementing with numerous things. Um, or, oh, eggs. They might give me salmonella. I'm not going to eat eggs whatsoever. You know, then you have a guaranteed choline issue almost. So, you know, I just think we need to have a more nuanced conversation about this among many, many other topics. Yeah. Oh, I love that common sense approach. And I'm over here like shuddering about the meat with the salt and the, all that. I used to be um, a personal chef. And so I took, you know, food safety courses and I just remember the examples they would use. And I'm like, people do that, but they do. And they don't realize that you're contaminating your entire salt container or your seasonings or whatever yes. when you're touching. And, and so I think, yeah, it's, it's, I love that you brought up that so much of it is common sense, you know, take care of all of your food in a way that is going to keep you and your family safe versus, you know, just kind of obsessing over these don't eat lists. And I was someone who ate fish when I was, when I tolerated it, I don't think I loved it in the beginning of my pregnancy. But I did eat fish through my pregnancy, and I remember at one point, um, well, through both my pregnancies, but I remember at one point in my first pregnancy going out to sushi, so my husband's half Japanese, so sushi was a big thing in his family, and we went out to sushi, and I was like, oh, I want fish so bad, and my husband's like, I wanted raw fish, and my husband's like, why don't you just eat it, and I'm like, you're not supposed to. I could get sick. And he's like, wouldn't everyone at the table get sick? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm pregnant. And he's like, I'm pretty sure Japanese ladies weren't stopping eating raw fish. And I was like, that's true. <laughs> I'm like, just because their recommendations and you know, when they're handling it well, it's not just picking up a piece of raw fish from the supermarket and chomping down on it. It's they're getting it super Such fresh and prepared fish. well. Yep. And I mean, it's a personal choice, I know, for everyone and their own comfort level and and all of that. Um, and I can't even tell you if I ended up eating it or not. I cannot remember. I do remember eating swordfish once during my second pregnancy and being a little bit nervous, but it was the special at one of our favorite restaurants and it was our anniversary. And I'm like, okay, if I eat one swordfish steak, 
my whole pregnancy, I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff really is about, you know, consistency and frequency of exposure, right? So, you know, if we think of like the tuna example, I think it's kind of like the FDA is throwing tuna a bit of a bone because they know how common and available the fish is for people since so many people eat canned tuna that they're like, okay, six ounces. But there are some people who take the information on tuna and they're like, I'm not going to eat it whatsoever. But having a single serving of a fish that might be higher in mercury is like, I mean, add it to the list of potential exposures to things that can be harmful. I mean, we're surrounded by it, right? So you have to kind of, yeah. you know, you have to make your choices and, and you know, do the best with, with what's available and also live a little because, you know, another thing on the flip side of the do not eat list is they're really not emphasizing very strongly don't have sugar, mm -hmm. but the adverse effects from excessive sugar intake in pregnancy are very well documented and very significant. And that's not something that people think about. Um, it's like, well, eggs are unsafe. So for breakfast, I'm going to have this cereal, which is sweetened with a whole bunch of sugar. And they don't think anything about that, right? So yes. I think we just need to, again, just look beyond um, sort of the basic pamphlet that so many of us get from our providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. And I love that you are educating on that as well. So I really like your, your common sense approach to all of that. So something else I really love about your approach is that you do really focus on a mindful approach to food versus this just kind of counting and tracking calories and macros. And so, and I know this is different if you have certain health conditions in some sense of things. Um, I am very much on the camp of not tracking, measuring, or counting anything. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you can encourage the pregnant mom who's listening, who's worried about getting what she needs without obsessing over it, you know, the extra caloric needs or these, this amount, like, you know, this many grams or that many grams. Yeah. So I think outside of a, a few exceptions, I, I really don't think most people need to be tracking anything uh, super long term at the very least. I'm, I think tracking has a purpose in the instances of things like you've just been diagnosed with gestational diabetes and you're trying to find out your carbohydrate tolerance, meaning how many carbs can you eat at a meal without experiencing high blood sugar? Well, tracking, like counting grams of carbs and monitoring your blood sugar and sort of making those correlations is a really important part of the treatment and management, right? So that's, that's an example where counting might make sense. Or maybe you read something about choline and you're like, man, I want to see how much choline I'm getting. That might be one of those short-term experiments where you can be like, how much am I getting in my usual diet versus how much do I need? The thing that I like to point out, as I think we were talking about earlier, was if you just focus on emphasizing some of the most nutrient-dense foods, including some of them in your diet, even if it doesn't make up the totality of your diet, a lot of these needs take care of themselves. So if you get enough protein and you're also eating produce, most of these micronutrient needs take care of themselves, really. Um, if you are eating to satiety, meaning you're paying attention to how quickly you fill up and you get to a point of being comfortably full but not overstuffed and you decide that's the time to stop eating, and on top of that, that meal carries you for, you know, in pregnancy you're hungry more often, so maybe it'll carry you an hour or two <laughs> outside of pregnancy and outside of breastfeeding. It You would hopefully have, want a meal to keep you full for you know, two, three hours at minimum, I'd say. But in pregnancy, we're usually pretty hungry. Um, if that is the case, you can be pretty sure that you ate the right amount of food, the right balance of macronutrients um, at, at that preceding meal. A lot of people want to overcomplicate it. I want somebody to like calculate how many calories I need and how many grams of this I need and how many, I mean, people drive themselves crazy to the point of disorders by getting too obsessed with the tracking. And often I find that the people who get so involved in the tracking, they will end up reverting to eating more packaged foods because it has 
numbers on the package and it's easier to count when you're eating whole foods and especially you're feeding a full, whole family and all the ingredients are split among many people. I mean, unless you're using a food scale for every single ingredient, your numbers are going to be off. Okay. <laughs> Even the packaged food numbers, FDA guidelines allow them to be off by 20%. So even if you are extremely diligent about counting everything, it's probably off anyways, and it doesn't matter. So the research on mindful eating actually shows that when people are encouraged to do more of this listening to your body thing on their hunger and fullness cues and what they're eating and what flavors, textures, smells, or whatever they're in the mood for, they actually end up eating less junk food as a result and eating an overall better balanced, more varied diet. So just take that into consideration because I think we've all been so bombarded with diet culture selling us, you know, these meal plans or whatever it is, these rules with numbers to follow that a lot of us are pretty disconnected from our bodies. And I'll tell you, pregnancy is the time when you are probably the most intuitive <laughs> of any other life stage. I mean, as a mom of two, probably that plus birth, because birth, you get in a weird, you know, mental birth brain space where you're, yeah. you're hundred percent going on instincts. Um, you're, you're very connected to that intuition and, and you need to own it and, and, be okay with it, listening to it. Um, you don't need an, an outside authority to tell you what to eat. But I will say for people who are new to this, and this is like, well, you know, there is a section on mindful eating um, actually in both of my books, but there's also meal plans. I hate meal plans. I'll say it, but there's meal plans that give as little portion guidance as possible, but give you an idea of the combinations and types of foods that I might recommend for meals and snacks that have an emphasis on let's meet the micronutrient needs and also let's encourage blood sugar balance and get you enough, you know, protein and not be too afraid of fat and all of that. Um, so you can look at those as like a guide and I still recommend that you, you know, follow your own lead, but those will give you some insight into sort of translating everything I'm talking about into real life. So use that as some meal inspiration, but don't get too obsessed with following them to a T. In fact, you can't follow them to a T because I intentionally didn't put specific portion sizes on there because you don't know. I, I can't know if your body needs 2000 calories or 2200 or 2400 or 2600 or 2800. I don't know how active you are. I don't know your genetics. I don't know your like happy place for your weight. I don't know how much weight is right for you to gain in your pregnancy versus somebody else. You know, in pregnancy, some days you're ravenously hungry and the next day you're not very hungry at all. And so if someone's to calculate your needs, what's to say it's correct every single day of the week, it might change day to day. And it's okay to eat more some days and less other days and not get too in the weeds. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you for clearing that up. I think I mean, I've used myself as an example so many times before because it was very much, I was definitely that person in my first pregnancy. And I'll explain why in a second where I was, you know, anxious in the beginning and then, you know, felt a little bit more like, okay, it's as long as I'm eating more real foods, it'll be okay. I'm going to get what I need. I'm avoiding these don't lists, but I'm, it'll be okay. And then I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes with my first pregnancy, which was very unexpected for myself because I think that I thought myself to be very healthy and I was in the holistic nutrition space. I was working as a personal chef and I had a lot of knowledge about nutrition, but I know now looking back, you know, I was, there was a lot of things I was doing that were different than I'm doing now because I know my body better and I know what works for my body now. And then I was, before I was pregnant, I was living off of caffeine and going too long between meals. And but when I mean too long, I mean not listening to my hunger and going far, by, far beyond that, you know, 
eating a bar when I ran out the door because I had to go to a chef client. And so anyway, so I become pregnant and I had gestational diabetes and I went over to the side of, you know, being very overconscious about tracking and measuring. And in the beginning, I know that it can be very important to have that baseline and to use that, like you said, as an experiment to become knowledgeable about your body and your tolerance and all that. Um, but it was really hard to find that fine line and then to go into my second pregnancy having a different mindset was really, really powerful. Um, so being someone, so I kind of want to touch a little bit on the gestational diabetes side of things, because this, you know, this is where you started in the prenatal nutrition world. Um, and I know that for myself, have, after having the experience of having gestational diabetes, and thankfully I was able to manage it just with some dietary changes and I didn't have to go on any medication and that I was super, super grateful for. This was before your book came out. Um, <laughs> But in between my two pregnancies, I read your book and I was able to avoid gestational diabetes the second time around. And I think a lot of it was due to the knowledge that I learned in your book. So I would love for you to maybe share a little bit about gestational diabetes specifically if the woman who's listening is either struggling with it or worried about it. Um, where some of the current nutritional recommendations fall short, kind of some of those gaps, but in specifically with gestational diabetes and how your recommendations differ a little bit. Sure. Yeah. And hooray for being able to avoid it the second time and manage it with food the first time. That's always, always nice. Um, you know, the conventional recommendations on gestational diabetes are, are, pretty interesting. And, and first of all, just to back up for anyone who's not familiar, gestational diabetes is, is elevated blood sugar that's either first diagnosed or first develops during pregnancy. And that's significant because it can mean that there are blood sugar issues going on beforehand, which you didn't know about, or they could have developed in pregnancy. Uh, and another way to define it is carbohydrate intolerance of pregnancy, meaning your body is not able to tolerate large amounts of carbohydrates at one time without experiencing high blood sugar. I feel like that is actually the clearest definition because it points to the dietary intervention that helps manage it, right? The conventional recommendations are, are a bit of a head scratcher because they're they're fairly high in carbohydrates. So they're you know a minimum of 175 grams of carbs per day. That's the minimum. Keep in mind. So if you meet with a dietitian and she calculates your calorie needs and they're on the higher end, she's going to recommend a higher carbohydrate intake than 175 grams. Now. That's a bit perplexing when you think about the way that gestational diabetes is diagnosed, which is often with a glucose tolerance test. So they give you a super sweet glucose drink, which is pure sugar, and then watch your blood sugar afterwards. And those depends where you are in the world or what state you're in or what practice you're going to. But the glucose tests range anywhere from 50 to 100 grams of glucose. Then you get a meal plan that has around 50, maybe more, grams of glucose, grams of carbohydrates, but most of your carbohydrates are going to eventually break down into glucose in your body at every meal. So if somebody fails a test that has a certain amount of glucose, meaning their blood sugar is elevated after it, why would we think the treatment for this person who has carbohydrate intolerance of pregnancy is going to be the same or more carbs than we're in the glucose test. So just a bit of a head scratcher for people. I found in practice that that level of carbohydrates was often too high. There were exceptions, certainly. For the people who are, who are not necessarily watching what they eat, and especially the people who are consuming a lot of sugar-sweetened beverages like sodas or even just high-sugar beverages like juices and smoothies and stuff all day long, then yeah, if we just dropped them down to 175 grams, their blood sugar would certainly improve because they were drinking a 80 gram smooth, 80 grams of carbohydrate smoothie. Um, and so if we drop them down and start just cutting out the, the sugary beverages, huge improvements. But then you'd have other people who were much more 
you can call it carbohydrate intolerant or insulin resistance, where they had to be much more careful about the level of carbohydrates they consumed. And maybe instead of giving them 50 grams of carbohydrates at a meal, they needed to cut it more to like 30 or maybe 20 or maybe 15 without experiencing high blood sugar. And that that's their personal carbohydrate threshold or personal carbohydrate tolerance. Um, and so for, for me, I found that the conventional guidelines really stressed people out a lot and, and didn't work <laughs> in, in many, many people. Because if you're putting forward a very carb heavy diet, yeah, they recommend protein, but they're very strict on fat because anything from the conventional guidelines is strict on fat. They would have elevated blood sugar after the meal and then they'd be confused because they followed the meal plan, but then also they'd be starving before it was the next time to eat because the meal was too low in fat and they just had a huge blood sugar roller coaster when you change it up and give them enough protein, don't restrict their fat and have them self-identify the level of carbohydrates their body can handle, they would eat until satiety, they would have good blood sugar levels, and they would generally stay full before it was the next time to have a snack or a meal. A lot of things figured themselves out and gestational diabetes became much less scary because I tell you, the quickest way to freak somebody out is to give them, here is the treatment for this, this pregnancy complication that we've just scared the bejesus out of you, right? Because we've listed all the complications that are going to happen. Ah, like, be scared, scared enough to follow this meal plan. Here's this meal plan. Lo and behold, you have high blood sugar after eating a meal plan, and then you really start freaking out. Because mm -hmm. then you're like, oh no, I'm doing a terrible job of this. Why isn't the meal plan it's not your fault. You were given information that doesn't actually adequately treat the condition. It's a mismatch <laughs> for, for the condition that your body is facing. And so when you instead present them with information that they do have wiggle room for going lower carb, first of all, you don't recommend as high a carb as a get-go. Um, but they also are noticing, hey, my blood sugar is great after this meal. Hey, I felt satisfied. Hey, I'm still able to eat yummy food. It's much less scary. The stress goes away. It's easier to manage. It's, but it's very, very common that people, you know, don't get the best of advice um, at first. They're already scared because the first week or two with gestational diabetes is scary when you don't have like a baseline, you've never been pricking your finger to check your blood sugar before, it, it feels very scary. But once you sort of settle into a routine in the end of the first week, second week, and you've been given advice that's actually working, it's a very empowering experience. And, and that's the side of things that I think doesn't get enough airtime is that it can be really empowering to start understanding how food affects your blood sugar and your mood and your hunger and fullness cues and satiety, it can be really empowering to notice like, oh, hey, when I eat this way, the scale isn't like skyrocketing up like it was before when I was just eating, you know, the usual stuff and all the smoothies and the juice and the, you know, bread and all the crackers and whatnot. Um, you feel more balanced and more in control. So there, there can be a silver lining with gestational diabetes. Mm hmm. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm really glad you touched on that mismatch. Um, I remember going in and, you know, working with the dietitian. And the first week I went in, I think I had to go every week into the hospital and meet with a dietitian and give her like my my glucose numbers. And then she would compare them to my food journal. And I remember her going through and going, OK, so you're eating enough vegetables and you're eating enough protein, but you're not quite eating enough carbs. <laughs> and I was like, well, my numbers are good. I was having some issues with my numbers in the morning. Um, and that was really just solved with having a snack at nighttime that worked for my body. And it was a, like a little bit of a snack with some carbs and some fat. And that kind of evened me out there. And that was a couple weeks before I figured that out. And thankfully, my numbers always stayed, but she made that comment a couple times when I would come in 
where it was like, but you're not having enough carbs. And then I, the next week I tried to add in more carbs because I was like, okay, I don't want to hurt my baby. My whole thing was, I don't want to hurt my baby. Mm -hmm. And then my numbers were off. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm so sorry. These two numbers were off. And she's like, that's okay. It's normal to have a few of your numbers off. Um, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, I adjusted things a little bit. My numbers were fine the next week. And it, the comment comes again. So it's so interesting that these are the recommendations. And, you know, I think it's important to point out that everybody is different and we all have a different tolerance and we all need a different yep. amount. Um, but for me, I was trying in the beginning to do what felt right for my body and follow, you know, kind of the lower recommendations. Cause I'm, I'm not a huge person. I'm only five feet tall. And so I was like, Oh, I'll kind of follow these recommendations. And then her going, no, this isn't enough. And then my like crazy brain went, Oh my gosh, I got to fix things. And that's right, where I got right. very obsessive with like, Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm, I need to have X amount of grams at every single right. meal, whether or not it made my numbers off. So Right. And then to have the experience where it works at some meals and then not, uh, not others. I mean, it yeah. makes you start feeling like a crazy person where we could just help you have like more stable blood sugar numbers with fewer carbs and you wouldn't have to freak out every meal. You'd know like, okay, if I'm going to have some carbs, I can get away with one piece of bread at a meal, but I probably can't have fruit with the meal. Great but the meal plan the dietitian gave you has bread and fruit. And if you don't have the bread and fruit, the sky is going to fall. I mean, it's just very silly. And I, I will say, you know, as a, as a good dietitian, I did my due diligence to follow the guidelines and teach from the guidelines at the beginning. And it was failing my clients. It became an issue, in my opinion, of professional ethics to continue providing information that was not working Mm -hmm. And after getting more into micronutrients, providing a micronutrient deficient diet that is not adequate for pregnancy, or to just let people self-select to eat less bread or less rice or less tortillas, or which wasn't even providing that many micronutrients for them from the get-go, right? Mm -hmm. You're eating more vegetables instead of an extra serving of rice? That should be a net benefit. But here we freak out. I could go into all the reasons they, that they freak out, but that would open another can of worms for probably another hour talking about ketones and stuff. But suffice to say, it is absolutely safe to eat within your own carbohydrate tolerance. You don't have to go full keto or anything, but you certainly don't need to, just for the sake of matching what the meal plan says, eat your you know piece of bread plus your fruit plus your <laughs> fill in the carbohydrate of choice in order to comply with something that clearly isn't working for your body, right? So, you know, the one hope I have is that while the guidelines in the U.S. have not shifted yet, um, the Czech Republic actually re refined their guidelines after um, seeing my book and seeing the information in there. And mm -hmm. so now instead of in the Czech Republic, they originally had a minimum carbohydrate requirement of pregnancy of 200 grams, so even more than what's in the US. They've now turned it on its head. They set a maximum of 200 grams of carbohydrates per day, and they've seen their um, requirements for insulin and medication in women fall to less than 10%. Mm -hmm. Massive improvements, huge healthcare savings, and imagine how much easier it is for the women too, right? I mean... Yeah less complications in pregnancy, less adverse birth outcomes, less birth interventions. I mean, let's just let people have balanced blood sugar. Why is it so controversial? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I know it shouldn't be so controversial to allow people to find their own tolerance and listen to their own bodies instead of feeling like they need to meet this number, which right. is, it's a disempowering experience that, that what you described is what I've heard over and over again. And it was hearing that over and over again, that made me go, okay, I'm going to write a book on this because I certainly can't see every client myself and people are not getting good advice. You know, this mm -hmm. is like making everybody stressed out and have unnecessarily high blood sugar. No, we got to We got to shift this. Yes. 
Yeah. And I think as someone who has read your book and, you know, followed a lot of your recommendations in the early stages of my second pregnancy, and really a lot of it was, um, you know, I went through this a whole journey in between my two pregnancies of finding my own balance when it came to nutrition in general. And it was really coming back to this place where I'm like, oh, right. My body responds really well to real whole foods. And when I listen to it, huh? <laughs> and, you know, that I think a lot of your advice is yeah. very easy to adopt. It's practical. It's not something that's going to drive someone crazy. Like, oh my gosh, I need to make all these changes. Just like you're talking about. It's, it's a lot more, you know, geared towards these, this is what we need. This is how to, you know, learn what's right for you. And this is why we don't necessarily need to follow these recommendations. We can listen to our bodies and follow what our bodies need. So I think that um, you did a Absolutely. good job of making it feel doable. Good. Good to hear. Yeah. So um, I want to honor your time. We have been talking for so long and I could literally talk to you for hours and hours on this subject. I find it so fascinating. Uh, we're all done having kiddos, but I love the topic of prenatal nutrition. I think it's so fascinating because it is so important. It's such an important time, not just in our lives, but in the lives of our kiddos as well and our, you know, our, yep. our kids who are growing and we can really give them a better start, you know, by having a really nutrient dense diet, but it doesn't also, you know, coming back to, it doesn't need to be overwhelming to do that for, for our kids. Um, and we can have a less stressful pregnancy when we just know the basics too. Exactly. So I'm curious from you being a mom of two now, is there anything that you've learned from your own pregnancies that maybe shifted your perspective on some of the advice that you give to pregnant moms? Uh, well, certainly, certainly the experience of the first trimester, and now I didn't even have nausea that bad in that I didn't like, I didn't throw up very often with either pregnancy, but both of them, I had that like low level kind of all day queasiness of like, mm -hmm. I had, um, had much more empathy for what my clients over the years had and continue to experience in the early part of pregnancy and really uh, identified that uh, 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 out of anything. I mean, yeah, someone, you're crazy, but like all things in pregnancy, it's not entirely within your control to like stop the nausea. So I knew, for example, if I tried to get a little bit of protein in, even if I had to like, I don't know, eat something super carby in order to like settle my stomach and then have a couple cashews or then eat like very slowly half of an egg. Like ugh. I knew that I would feel much better. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that on the days when I didn't make an attempt at managing the nausea with all the things, I felt significantly worse, but still doing all the quote right things didn't eliminate it entirely. So that was a little bit like, I definitely came into my first pregnancy thinking, oh, I'm going to avoid, I'm going to avoid the nausea, right? I know all the things, I'm going to do the B6 and the magnesium, and I've been eating real food, so my nutrient stores are good, I'm not going to have nausea, and it's going to be fine, and I'll just take my ginger and it'll go away. And then yeah, all those things helped, but they didn't fix it necessarily. Um, so that, that's definitely a, a bit of an ego kill. <laughs> so I think pregnancy really teaches you in, in many ways to surrender um, because your body, your hormones, there's a lot of stuff that, yes, we can, we can make little baby steps towards sort of pushing our own agenda, but we can't necessarily outsmart what's happening. And hey, there might be a purpose for the nausea anyways, which I go into in the book. So it, sometimes it's like these symptoms are there for a reason and it's okay. Um, I should probably stop there. But yeah, I just, I just developed a lot more grace and empathy and, uh, and, uh, and you know, an appreciation for trusting your intuition in pregnancy um, going through it myself. Mm, I love that so much. Yeah, it really is a surrender <laughs> to your body, especially in those, especially in those early weeks, for sure. Yep. So I have a few fun little rapid fire questions that I love to ask all of my guests. But before we dig into those, I would love to know where my listeners can find you and all you have to offer. I know you have some courses along with your books. 
Yes. So you can find me at lilynicholsrdn.com. I give away the first chapter of Real Food for Pregnancy for free. Um, if you go to the freebies tab, there's a bunch of other freebies, one of which is a free video series on gestational diabetes. If you happen to identify with that, kind of talks you off the ledge. Uh, my website links out to both of my books. Amazon, of course, is usually like the, the best place to get them. They're always on sale and all that. You also have my blog on my website. So, you know, there's 250 plus articles on there. So you can spend a lot of time reading there for free. As far as other places, so um, I also teach professional level webinars on prenatal, postpartum, breastfeeding, and other topics over at the Women's Health Nutrition Academy. So you can look up that. There's a bunch of webinars for myself and some of my colleagues. And as far as social media, I'm most active these days on Instagram. And my handle's the same as my website. So it's Lily Nichols RDN. Awesome. Thank you. I am sure if they don't already have your books, they're going to go out and grab your books <laughs> because they are great. And you are so knowledgeable. I appreciate you so much sharing all of your knowledge with us. So my last three questions I love to ask, I call them rapid fire, but if you want to take longer, you can. Um, so my first question is, what is your favorite thing to cook? That is such a hard one for me to answer because I'm, I cook a lot. I mean, I cook every day. I try to make the majority of our family meals, but I, my, my, I'm such a like cook by the seat of my pants person. Mm. I'm not like a recipe person. So I'm like, oh, the green beans look good at the store this week. Great. And as I'm shopping, I'm like, oh, the wild salmon's on sale. Great. We'll just have green beans and salmon for dinner and just call it a day. I don't really do a ton of like meal planning and fancy recipes. So I, I can't say there's something, I kind of see cooking as, as a bit of a job that like, uh, it takes time and it's kind of annoying, but the alternative of buying pre-made food at the grocery store is like overpriced and doesn't taste good and doesn't have good ingredients. And sort of the same thing goes for restaurants as well, unless it's a really fancy restaurant. So I kind of just cook whatever. Um, you know, some meals that are favorites in our house are um, the grass-fed beef meatloaf. There's a recipe for that in Real Food for Pregnancy has hidden liver in it. We didn't talk about liver on the podcast, but it's a really, our whole family loves it. My toddler devours it. We just roast it all in one sheet pan with vegetables and it's just an easy filling meal that makes enough for leftovers for several extra meals. And that's my kind of cooking, like nutrient dense, pretty fast to put together. It makes leftovers. <laughs> I'm a very like utilitarian kind of a cook. I love that though. That meatloaf sounds delicious. And it's been a while since I brought any liver into our house. My, my oldest would eat it all the time when she was a baby, but my youngest was not as interested. My youngest will eat liverwurst, but we haven't had it in a mm. while. <laughs> I don't know how liverwurst yeah. would taste in a meatloaf though. <laughs> I don't know. You could try it. Yeah. <laughs> So um, my second question is then, and it's related to this, so I'm interested if you have an answer. So what would be your favorite thing to order if you're going to go out to a restaurant when we can go out to restaurants? Yeah, right. Um, so usually, I mean, it depends on the restaurant. If we're just at sort of like a family restaurant, uh, you know, burger joint type thing, I usually just do like a, a lettuce wrapped burger or burger on top of a salad. I do order fries. Thank you very much. It's like, yeah, I could do without the bun, but I'm going to have some fries. Um, that's like something that you can get almost anywhere, no matter like the fanciness level of the restaurant. If I'm at like a really fancy restaurant though, and this is new as of like the last mm, five or so years, I've really developed a taste for seafood, which I was never a seafood person, didn't have it a ton growing up. But now I, I really enjoy seafood. So if there's like, you know, some good halibut or salmon or something, I'll usually just order whatever the seafood special is. And, mm -hmm. and it's so weird saying that because I was never a seafood person until recently. It's so good, though. I mean, I grew up, I live on the East Coast, so 
I grew up eating seafood my whole life, but I have definitely developed more an appreciation for it as I've gotten older as well. So the last question is that I talk a lot here on the podcast, and we've talked a lot about this today, about moving away from kind of these strict, rule, strict rules around food and life and really individualizing wellness, what I like to call your beautiful balance. So what does your beautiful balance mean to you? Oh, well, I mean, back to everything we were saying about mindful eating. I'm you know, I I think over the years you start to identify the areas in your life that'll make you kind of neurotic and how you need to like distance yourselves from the neuroses. So, you know, way back to my dietetics education, I identified that like, wow, the crazy obsessive tracking of numbers, which we had to do sometimes for class assignments, made me neurotic about food. And I don't like the way that makes me feel. So I don't do numbers. I know that if I'm getting like enough protein and getting my vegetables and the vegetables are always cooked in fat or salad is dressed with fat, I'm going to feel good. So I kind of just go with some of these like basic ideas instead of letting the numbers um, push me. Same thing with exercise. Um, Early in my career, I did Pilates teacher training and taught Pilates for many years And I know that being in gym culture, but even being in like Pilates studio culture where people are so hyper aware of their bodies and like nitpicking little things like, "Ah, I just want to get rid of this. That's not good for my mental health either. Like I really don't care about that, which is why I've kind of moved away from the fitness thing. I just want to move so my body feels good and I'm functional and I can go from like sitting on the floor with my kids to standing up while holding a baby without difficulty, right? I just want to like live without difficulty. I want to be able to hike and not be super exhausted at the end, even if I'm carrying one of the kids or something. Like my goal is just to live, right? So I eat in a way that gives me energy so that I can do all the other mom things that have to get done. And I move my body only to the degree that I need to to stay functional and happy, but I'm not going to intentionally nitpick certain parts of my body and try to do exercises to quote fix those things. I'm not going to kill myself in the gym until I'm totally exhausted. In fact, I haven't sat foot in the gym in years and probably never will again. I just want to like move for the joy of moving and being out and about with, with the family. So uh, yeah, I'm just kind of anti-rules with <laughs> with a lot of this stuff that that's how I find my balance is just opting out of of the the neuroses around all of these things that's so prevalent in both of these industries Mm -hmm. oh my gosh I could not love that more especially coming from someone who is so knowledgeable and gives so much incredible information but you know also being like it's okay we don't need to be neurotic about this we can we can really be practical about this and do this in a way that is practical and doable and listening to our bodies. So I love that. Oh my gosh. So much incredible information, Lily. Thank you so much. I could definitely continue to talk to you for another two hours. (laughs) Um, Well, it hasn't been that long yet, but I could definitely continue to talk to you for so long. So thank you so much for taking the time to be on with us today. Thank you. Great questions. and happy to come on again if you want to. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. If you loved it, would you take a screenshot and share it with a friend over on Instagram and tag me in it? It helps me so much to know what you love and are taking away from each episode. If you really loved it, would you hop over to iTunes and give me a star rating and review? Every rating and review helps this podcast be seen and heard by more women who need to hear the message of balance and wellness without deprivation. It's the best free gift you could give me. And as a reminder, the information and opinions on this podcast are meant for education and inspiration only and are not to be taken as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please consult with a trusted practitioner before making any changes. Have a beautiful day, friend, and I'll see you in the next episode.